In the next few lessons, we will be looking at animal genetics. So this is basically, we want to manipulate the outside of the animal, so look at the outside. And by to be able to do this, meaning um, for the amount of uh, milk a cow produces, or the amount of meat they produce, or even the amount of eggs a chicken, let's say, um, lays, all those outside characteristics, they are manipulated and controlled by genes on the inside of the animal. So in order to change for us farmer, a breeder, to change the outside of an animal, we need to look at the inside of the animal. So basically the animal genetics or um, genetics itself is the study of the inheritance um, of characteristics from one generation to the next. So it's passing on these traits from one generation to the next. And that's also known as heredity. So in parentheses there on the slide, heredity is basically how these things are inherited or how characteristics are passed on from one individual to the next. So uh, I, wanna, I like actually this picture in the corner right here because this shows us basically what can be done with genetics. You have here an individual that lays maybe only one egg every day or one egg Let's hope not, but once a month, that will be a very bad chicken. But they just lay one egg. So by looking at the genes and the genotypes, we can either manipulate the genes or just select which individual we actually want to breed further. And we can, by changing their genes or manipulating their genes, they can eventually, not the same individual, but another individual, hence the comb right at the top, it's a different individual, we want them to actually lay more eggs. So we select the ones, we change them, we allow them to breed the ones that we want to lay more eggs because this is good for a farmer or in general humans. So the main thing about animal genetics in agriculture, we're not really looking to improve the characteristics of an animal for the animal, but actually for humans. So the changes here are not always necessarily good for the individual or species, but it's also not necessarily bad for them. I mean, in this case, take the chicken example, it's not necessarily bad for chicken to lay more than one egg a day. So it's just the, the main focus here is on humans. So there's a couple of terms you guys must be familiar with, um, genetic terminology. The first thing is a chromosome. So meaning the genes we manipulate or the DNA is inside a chromosome. So a chromosome itself is a DNA that is tightly coiled or wound around certain types of proteins. And then we get structures that look like this. So this is one chromosome right over here, and this would be a second chromosome. And usually all individuals, even humans, we inherit usually one chromosome from our, let's say in this case, from our dad, and another chromosome usually from our mother. So that's why they're two different colors, but they're the same length. So these two usually pair up, so meaning the same genes on these two chromosomes. Uh, depending on the species, humans have 46 of these chromosomes, different sizes, different lengths, um, but um, certain other species, they could have uh, four, mm -hmm. 43 chromosomes, or they can okay, use just pairs of, uh, um, not odd numbers, even numbers. Like as we have 46, uh, for some times we do get on odd numbers um, species, but it would, anyway, I digress. Usually there are different kind of amounts of chromosomes depending on the species. So in this case, always one from mom, one from dad, these two are put together. They're actually called homologous chromosomes, meaning they are the same length, same size, and they've got the same genes on here. In the picture we can see they've got two R's, each one of them has an R at the same position, P's, A's, whatever. So these letters are just used to name them, it's not really their names. So just to show us where these genes are located, we can maybe get a chromosome that is maybe just as tall as my mouse right here. So in this case, two of these. So then a gene specifically, a small part of chromosome that contains a particular sequence of DNA. So here we have, if a mouse will just work, one gene on this chromosome, the similar gene on the, on the other chromosome. So this is a gene. Uh, so it's a small piece of this long DNA strand, only a small section of it. Then the locus refers to the position of the gene. So this right here where the R is found, uh, mouse, is the position of this particular gene. So right here, we don't find the R gene at the bottom here, we find it up here. So this is the locus, its position on the chromosome. Then we have different alleles. So these two would be alleles. Here we have a variation of a gene on this chromosome. Here we have, in this case, a similar variation. So because they're both small Rs, they're the same alleles. 
but let's look at C at the bottom here. If we have a small C and a capital C, it's still gene C, but the small C and the um, big C represents the fact that there's a small DNA difference between the two. There could be a mutation maybe in the one that's not in the other one, a small base pair difference or change in this one that's not in this one or vice versa. That's why it's still gene C, but it looks different why it's written with a small and a capital letter C. So these are two different alleles. Same alleles, same, 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 but this one has two different ones, so two different alleles for the same gene. So then there are things called homozygous and heterozygous. So in this case, these all these will be homozygous um, chromosomes, meaning or homozygous genes, because they have the same alleles. So homo means the same, two of the same alleles for the same characteristic. Then this one would be het um, heterozygous because they have two different types of alleles for the same gene or the same characteristic. They say this gene right here determines what color this individual would be. So because they're two different um, alleles, the color that, say, the small C represents could be, I don't know, black, and the big C could represent white. So it's going to be different. So it still has to do with color, but it's two different variations of a color. So it's two different colors, but the, the characteristic is color. So then a genotype and phenotype. Genotype is the genes, the genes responsible for the straight, uh, whatever we're looking at, it's a color. A phenotype is what we talked about, what we see on the outside, so outside of the animal, if it was color, or the amount of eggs that are laying, or whatever you see outside the animal, that is the phenotype. Then we've got dominant and recessive. In this case, for the alleles, capital usually refers to dominant, and small letters refers to recessive. It just means that, say, let's take the heterozygous individual right here. If this animal um, had these two alleles for this gene, one from mom, one from dad, this animal would be white because I said the capital C is white, represents white, and the small c black. And a dominant allele suppresses the effect of a recessive allele. So even though this individual has a small c, has the black allele, it won't look black on the outside because the white one suppresses or dominates basically the recessive allele. So we don't see the black. But if this individual were to have children and it passes on this allele to its kids, it's possible that can have a black child if another small c is inherited from the mother, say, if this was the father. So it also has to do with how it's inherited and the one allele dominates the other one, in, in a sense. So it basically suppresses the effect and a recessive allele can only be seen when two of these alleles are present. So this individual will only be black if there's two small c's. Then you'll have a black individual. Okay, so basically there is um, a very famous um, Austrian monk, he's called Gregor Mendel, he lived in the 1800s, and he's known as the father of genetics because he was the first individual to actually start and manipulate or breed with certain um, species. He actually did the pea plants, that's why the pea plants actually got associated with him, so he was a lover of plants. And he bred them and realized that certain characteristics were the ones he selected. Um, the offspring would either be a certain height or a certain color or have a certain shape and so on. So he, the two main um, laws named after him, or two things, not really named after, but two things he realized and that we know now. The first law is called the law of segregation. This has to do with Moses. So during Moses, here we have two possibilities of what can happen. So during Moses, uh, specifically your metaphase stage, when the chromosomes align on the equator, Again, you've got two from dad, two from mum. It's possible that they can align like this on the equator, but it's also possible that they can align like this, meaning one from dad on this side, one from mum, one from mum, one from dad. You can see it's different to these two. And then based on how they're aligned in anaphase when they separate and the gametes form, each one in this case will look different based on how these chromosomes actually aligned on the equator. So this has to do with law segregation. So how they separate from one another into the gametes, that's called the law segregation. Two alleles control trait inheritance and each allele separate during gamete formation or during meiosis. The second law is actually the same as the first law, but the, the emphasis just changes. The second law says, um, the law of independent assortment, 
the genomosis or genome specific anaphase, the alleles separate randomly. So the point being, yes, there are two possibilities, but it's completely random. Nothing actually determines why this happened or whether it will happen this way or whether it will happen this way. It's just completely random. So they separate completely random from each other when these gam gametes form because they have aligned in metaphase completely random. So it's basically the same thing. One thing just says they separate from one another into different gametes. The other one says the fact that they separate, the separation is random. Okay, so this you guys have to remember. Sometimes this asks these um, two laws in a short question or a multiple choice question. Okay, then I just quickly want to go through monohybrid and dihybrid crosses. If you guys want a more in depth um, um, gone through of this, uh, just go through my uh, life sciences um, uh, videos again. There I go through the entire process of monohybrid and dihybrid crosses and exactly how it works. For agriculture, they don't ask you guys to do it step by step. You don't have to write down exactly how these crosses happen. Usually they ask you to do a punnet square, hence why I have a punnet here um, on the slide. And they usually ask short questions about whatever you guys did. So the monohybrid cross is quite easy. Usually you have one pair of genes, meaning you've got two alleles usually for whatever characteristic you're looking at. You've got two chromosomes and these two alleles on them. So that's basically it. And these two control one characteristic. In this case, we're looking at color. So the color of the mouse here is gray. And for somehow, uh, some pairing can actually give you a brown mouse. So basically in this punnet, if you have two gray individuals, both of them heterozygous, two different bees, capital, small, so it's heterozygous, both of them, they eventually will give you two gametes. So this dad, two sperm cells, so meaning these two chromosomes, they separate from one another during meiosis, like we saw on the previous slide. One goes into one cell and the other one goes into the other cell. The same thing happens with a female. So in this case, when you've got a capital B right over here, capital B right over there, these two pair together and then give you a gray mouse, which is homozygous dominant because it has two of the same alleles, homozygous, and two of them are capital letters, so it's dominant alleles. And then if you have a small B right over here that pairs with a capital B from mum, you get a heterozygous individual and the same thing happens here. Um, capital B from dad, small B from mum, heterozygous. But you can also, because they both were heterozygous, they've got small B, so with a small B from dad and a small B from mum, they join together, you get a homozygous recessive individual and lo and behold, this gives you a, a brown mouse. So basically your genotype ratio meaning the genes, what you get is you get one individual that's capital B, capital B, so it's one to two capital B, small b, you've got your capital B, small b, two of them, and to one small b, small b, which is right over here. So this is your genotype, meaning what the letters, which, what you see of the letters. So one to two to one is your genotype ratio. Your phenotype ratio is what you physically see on the outside. So the color, you see one, two, three gray mice, but you see one brown one. So your phenotype ratio is three to one. So again, what this the ratios are telling you, and they will ask you guys this in the exam, is just the probability of getting a gray mouse versus a brown mouse. There's not like these two individuals got four children. No, it just shows you the probability, a quarter probability of getting a homozygous dominant one, two quarters possibilities of getting a heterozygous individual, and a quarter possibility of getting a brown mouse, which is homozygous recessive. That's basically it. It tells you. Okay, so for your dihybrid crosses, it's a little bit more um, complicated. But usually, again, if they do ask you guys a dihybrid cross, it will be just the punnet. They give you actually the entire punnet and then ask you just questions about it. Um, or you can just do um, short questions. They don't ask you guys to do the entire thing. So just the difference between monohybrid and dihybrid. Dihybrid cross, um, two pairs of genes now, four alleles. In this case, one, two, three, four in an individual controls two characteristics. In this case, for this one, we're looking at um, pea plants again, but color and shape specifically of the two. So in this case, you have four alleles. The R in this case, just the letter R represents one gene and the letter Y represents the second gene or the second characteristic. First characteristic, second characteristic. 
So for the die hybrid cross, your opponent will be a little bit more complicated. There would be 16 blocks because that's the possibility how these alleles can actually pair with one another or how the gametes can form. And the genotype ratio, I did not put in here because they never ask you this. It's usually too complicated to figure out. It is possible, but they usually don't ask it. And then your phenotype ratio, if the two parents were heterozygous for both these um, characteristics, both genes, meaning capital small, capital small, you always get the ratio 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. That is, we have heterozygous parents. So in this case, 9, 9 yellow and round, these guys down here then you've got three yellow and wrinkled one two three there there are three green rounds one two three and one green wrinkled right over here so usually it's nine three three one that's your phenotype ratio so how do you get these gametes to the side again let's say the top side was the father this, um, the side here is the mother the gametes and how they fuse how do you get the gametes in the first place you write out your individual this individual is capital small capital small and your gametes you actually do like you do the line crossing um, for the mono hybrid again go check out my life sciences video if you guys are confused about this so with the first type of gamete you've got your actually say the the rule is like foil so first outer inner last so let's do the first the first of this gene, the first of that gene. So R and Y, capital, capital. Here you've got your first possibility, capital R, capital Y. Um, then your outer is your capital here with your small y at the back. So outer ones, outside, outside of what we've written. Capital, small, here that is. Then your inner ones is small r, capital Y. A capital R, small, um, small r, capital Y. And then your outers. So the outside one the last one sorry of the first um, gene and the last one of the second gene small r small y there you've got that so these are your four possible gametes that can form from this individual whether it's the mum or the dad doesn't matter they look the same both of them are heterozygous so these are the four you put to the side and it's the same four you put at the top right there and then capital you put down capital you put down capital Y, capital Y. So it's R, R, Y, Y, all capitals. Do the same one for all the other ones and then you get your planet. Okay, so the last one basically, last slide. They will also ask you guys about qualitative and quantitative characteristics. So for your qualitative characteristics, think of literally quality. So whatever you're looking at, the phenotype will be, I, I want to say pure, meaning if you look at color, it will be definitely yellow, it will be definitely brown. Um, when you look at it will be definitely a small individual, no, whatever the centimeters are or the meters. It's a very small individual, it's a very tall individual. There's nothing in between, as an example. So qualitative is either or. It's either this, this, this thing or it's the other thing, especially. You can definitely see the difference in an individual. So that's qualitative characteristics. Usually the second group there is controlled by two alleles, and it's usually just one gene, meaning that I can know how to tell. So the three alleles are either or, either this thing or that thing. So the third bullet characteristics with the definite phenotype, like I just said, green, not greenish, yellow. It's either going to be green or yellow, not in between. So sometimes they give you an example and then ask you what type of characteristic is this, um, quantitative or qualitative, then you'll say, say qualitative. If, like the mono fiber cross, if you see it's not bl black and maybe it's not gray or black slash white, it's either black or white type thing. Okay, but usually they ask you about the quantitative characteristics. So the quantitative means quantity, which refers to the amount or can be like the amount of something. So th this is controlled by more than two alleles generally, more than one gene. So two genes, three genes, so on, more than two alleles, because this can be something in between. So meaning there's quantity, there are many options within the one characteristic, um, think of it that way. Then the third bullet there says polygenic inheritance. This is a type of polygenic inheritance. Poly means many. Genic refers to the genes. So many genes are inherited, basically. So your quantitative characteristics is an example of a polygenic inheritance. So the characteristics have intermediate phenotypes. And this is actually the best example is things like height. Because you don't just get a very small or a very high individual, very tall individual. You get something in between. Many, many things in between. 
So height usually is a good example of this type. So when you actually hear height, think polygenic inheritance or quantitative and milk yield as well. You don't get a cow that just gives you a little bit of milk or a lot of milk. It can be anywhere in between. Depends on what the animal is eating during the day, what environment she's in. If you're drinking enough water, all those things. So your, your environment also plays a role. And then obviously your genes play a role as well. So the last bullet is actually the important, very, very important thing. This is how they ask you guys this in the exam. So in this example, they say for every dominant allele, so every capital, it adds five centimeter to an individual's height. So these are three different individuals. You can't change an individual's genes unless you're working in a laboratory. But this refers to in your herd. You've got a couple of cows. So say for three here, your first individual, which is 40 centimeters, Okay, let's not make it cattle. They say it's plants. <laughs> it's a very small cow. This. Okay, they say it's plants. This this plant is homozygous recessive. So meaning it's got one, two, three genes. A, B, C, three genes. And all of these have small letters. So and if they have all small letters, it's 40 centimeters. So if every dominant, meaning every capital, adds you five centimeters, how tall would this individual be with one capital? You take 40, because all the small ones are 40, plus five then, because you've got a capital C now, it adds five centimeters. This individual will then be 45 centimeters. In this instance here, you've got one, two capitals. So it means you have to add 10 centimeters. So if your base height is 40 centimeters with all smalls, and you've got two capitals now, you add 10, 40 plus 10 is 50 centimeters. So if you were to have an individual that has all capitals, all dominant alleles, this will actually be the tallest individual you can possibly get. So let's add, it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six capitals, which is then, do my math, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, so it'll be 30 centimeters you add to the 40, so that'll be 70 centimeters. So 70 centimeters will be your tallest possible plant. So that's basically how you do this example. Okay, that's it for the first lesson.